This hearing is called to order. Good morning. This hearing, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us today as we examine federal policy and regulatory impediments for small businesses in the marine industry. I know that each of our witnesses have traveled quite a bit to be with us. And, and we here uh, at the committee appreciate that. The, the coastal and inland water transportation system is often the economic lifeblood uh, of the regions uh, where they are located. A healthy and vibrant water transportation system is critical to the small businesses that directly use the system, as well as those who support those firms. While proven as being one of the most efficient and environmentally friendly methods of transporting goods across the country, an aging system of locks, dams, and undredged channels threatens um, the continued viability of these waterways as reliable shipping avenues. It is not just the uh, regular wear and tear uh, on these avenues that is negatively uh, impacting the small businesses that utilize them. State and Federal policies and regulatory impediments also threaten the continued viability of these long-standing industries. We will hear numerous examples today from our witnesses on these issues. This hearing represents a forum for us to hear firsthand how important the maritime industry is to our nation and the problems that are preventing economic growth. Again, I want to thank each of our witnesses for taking the time uh, to be with us today. Unfortunately, I have an unavoidable scheduling conflict and must, be, uh, must leave the hearing. I know that one of my colleagues that has been working on uh, issues facing the maritime industry since the, he came to Washington. Uh, uh, and I would ask the gentleman from Florida, Mr. West, uh, to now chair the hearing. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to Chairman Kaufman for allowing me the opportunity to host this important meeting and also to my colleague, Mr. Tipton from Colorado. Welcome to our distinguished panelists and thank you for taking the time to answer our questions. As some of you may know, the marine industry in the state of Florida alone is responsible for the creation of more than 200,000 jobs and represents an $18 billion industry. These numbers are only a portion of the large impact that this industry has on our nation. Representing a sizable chunk of our working population, I see no better time to zero in on the industry which is paramount to our way of life in South Florida and throughout this nation. I have heard from many in the marine industry in South Florida about how the abundance of regulations emanating from Washington, D.C. is making it harder to conduct and maintain successful businesses. Regulations are creating a toxic business environment for so many, from builders, manufacturers, and retailers to craftsmen, technicians, and suppliers that are affecting job creators across the board. It is our duty in the House Committee on Small Business to assess these challenges and provide solutions to help businesses grow. It is also my hope that regulators will take note of the valuable insight that is given here today. I look forward to hearing each of your perspectives as we move forward. Before we begin, I want to give a special thank you to Ms. Christina Hebert and also Kitty McGowan and the entire South Florida Marine community for helping to bring this very important and critical issue to our committee's attention. And not this time, I'd like to ask would any other member, uh, Mr. Tempton, uh, would like to make an opening statement? Thank you. Now, now I'd like to take the time to talk about the hearing rules. The time and lights that you have before you, each of you will have five minutes to deliver your testimony. The light in front of you will start out as green. When you have one minute remaining, the light will turn yellow. Finally, at the end of your five minutes, it will turn red. Because of the fact we don't have many uh, members here on the panel, uh, we can go a little bit over. I ask that you try to adhere, though, to that time limit. Our first witness is Christina Hebert, Chief Operating Officer for operations of Ward's Marine Electric Incorporated in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. 
Wards is a 62-year-old, third-generation, family-owned and operated business dedicated to providing for the electrical needs of the recreational marine industry. The company provides mobile dockside service, engineering, engraving, and design services, as well as distributes a complete line of marine electric equipment, and most of their service work is performed in marinas and boatyards where they act as subcontractors. Thank you for being with us today, Ms. Hebert, and we look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Congressman West, and thank you, Congressman Tipton, for this opportunity to have this um, very important hearing to discuss something uh, very significant to our industry. As stated, my name is Christina Hebert. <clears throat> I am representing as President of the Marine Industries Association of South Florida, and I am also a board member of the U.S. Super Yacht Association. As Congressman West mentioned, I am third generation owner and operator of Wards Marine Electric. My family business has been in uh, Fort Lauderdale for 62 years. And um, as he also mentioned, we do dockside service. And while I have technicians that can travel anywhere across the globe, there is no place better in the entire world than the United States that has the greatest concentration of skilled labor and tradesmen, and specifically in South Florida. Just to give you an idea, I know the Congressman mentioned um, the statistics for the State of Florida, but in the Tri-County area, which is Broward, Dade, and Palm Beach County, the recreational marine industry represents an $8.9 billion economic impact, 107,000 jobs, and $3.6 billion in wages and earnings. That is extremely significant. This is about workers. These are families that are able to uh, purchase homes, go to schools, so on and so forth. Um, as I stated, my company can travel all across the world. However, we want to make sure that they are able to stay here. As a small business, one of the most, um, the largest operating expense is obviously workers' compensation. And my company, um, customer service doesn't come first. Safety comes first. My employees' safety and the boat's safety. If those two are safe, we will get the customer satisfaction. With that being said, though, workers' compensation is one of our number one operating expenses, and it is uh, cumbersome to do that for, for small businesses. Just to give you an idea, um, the recreational marine industry is 95 percent, as far as the uh, Marine Industries Association of South Florida, 95 percent of our members are small businesses. Um, they either work for themselves or they work for a small business. And when I say small business, I mean 10 or fewer employees. The workers' compensation that is required in the marine industry for, um, for these workers falls under two categories. One, you have state compensation, and two, you have longshore and harbor workers' compensation. Congress for many years has sought relief for this, for the recreational industry. Clearly, our workers are not um, commercial. We are not exposed to the same hazards and has sought numerous times to afford relief to the industry. In 1984, there was uh, relief done for boats 65 feet. In 2009, as part of the American Recovery and Restoration Act, H.R. 1, an amendment was made that would um, exclude the recreational repair industry instead of creating a footage to exclude it, capture it. We worked very hard for many years um, to show the safety record, the risks that are not there for the recreational industry, and paired with the insurance industry. Congress did a great job. You did your job. The amendment was made. And it finally afforded an opportunity for small businesses to be able to stick with state workers' compensation, have it be affordable, have our labor rates be comparable to those international, and keep the jobs in the United States to be able to have those 200,000 jobs. The Department of Labor is the agency in charge of uh, um, monitoring and enacting that legislation as it relates to the Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation Act. They had a rule. I understand agencies have to do rule implementations. And there was a lot in the rule that came out that made a lot of sense, and I understand that there were some, some dates and there was some clarification. And as far as the recreational industry on the manufacturing side, they did a great job. There was a clear line established for workers to be able to get covered, what is recreational, what is commercial, great job. On the repair side, not so much. There was, um, number one, a misunderstanding of what the industry represents. Number two, there was not a communication with that segment of the industry. And number three, a definition was put in um, that relates to commercial maritime shipping um, and really wasn't related to the repair industry and has never been a part of the legislative history. Is there a solution? Why are we here today? Yes. 
We have language that we would like to be able to substitute, the language that was used for the manufacturing side, and we know that that would be the intent, um, given that the agency should keep the intent um, of the congressional amendment that was made in 2009, and it would help small businesses and keep workers covered. Otherwise, they will go without the coverage because it will not be something they can afford. I thank you for your time and look forward to the resolution. Thank you, Ms. Hebert. Next up is Mr. Mark Ducharme, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Monterey Boats in Williston, Florida. Founded in 1985, Monterey Boats employs about 270 people and designs, engineers, and manufacturers several types of boats, pleasure crafts, and cruisers. Mark received his Bachelor of Science in Accounting from the University of Florida and his Master's Degree in Taxation from the University of South Florida. Welcome to the Small Business Committee, Mr. Ducharme. Good morning, Congressman. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning on the business activity tax nexus issue. I am here today representing a broad group of organizations and businesses, the Coalition for Interstate Tax Fairness and Job Growth, a group working together for enactment of the Business Activity Tax Simplification Act. Our coalition has several hundred supporters. Among those are small businesses such as my own, Monterey Boats. Attempts by some states to assess sales, gross receipts, or income taxes on businesses that have customers but no physical presence in the jurisdiction is simply arbitrary and wrong. We understand st states face the great temptation of raising tax revenues from those who do not vote in its elections or utilize state resources. We only engage in interstate commerce by providing products or services and do so without any physical presence in the state. But efforts to expand traditional ta definitions of tax nexus have become completely absurd. For example, the State of Michigan secured a copy of Monterey Boat's Federal Tax Return and assessed a 2011 gross receipts tax in the amount of $376,000 by allocating our entire worldwide sales to the State. Monterey Boat's, as should be pointed out, has no property in Michigan, no sales offices in Michigan, no agents in Michigan, and no employees in Michigan. Yet Michigan claimed the authority to tax our sales based merely on the fact that Monterey Boats has customers in its jurisdiction and considers nexus is achieved with only one day of contact in the state, including delivery, delivery in company-owned rented, leased, or borrowed trucks. Another example is New Jersey. We received a phone call in October 2004 from an agent with the New Jersey Division of Taxation notifying our truck was being impounded along with a shipment of boats until we remitted $176,000. After retaining an attorney and negotiating the release of the truck, the driver, and the load of boats, we received a formal jeopardy assessment from the State. We remitted funds to the State and began the appeals process. In addition, the State placed a lien on any receivables due to Monterey for boats sold anywhere in the country. After seven years, in August 2011, and after over $100,000 in legal fees and countless man, hour, man hours accumulating information, we received a final determination from the State upholding their position and then requiring us to file annual tax returns. Although we still have the ability to file, file a final appeal with the New Jersey Tax Court, it isn't economically feasible to do so, and they are completely aware of that fact. What is worse is that Michigan and New Jersey are no, not alone. Massachusetts, for example, claims that a business has established the nece necessary nexus for corporate income, income tax purposes if that business has vehicles that travel through Massachusetts more than 12 times in one year, even if, if it has no employees, offices, or inventory in Massachusetts. It should be easy for the members of this committee to see the possibilities and the dangers here. States cast a covetous eyes on the potential tax revenue from out-of-state corporations. The previously mentioned tax bills are not part of the budget planning for Monterey, and it will hinder us as a manufacturer as we attempt to survive in a super competitive environment and keep our 250 employees working steadily and producing our fine boats. Unless Congress steps in to clarify that the U.S. Constitution requires a physical presence nexus and sets forth a clear, bright line test for what constitutes physical presence, then we will continue to have impossible plan for laws, regulation, and enforcement actions that vary across the 50 states. There is, in fact, legislation that has been reported favorably by the House Judiciary Committee that we believe would solve the problem. This legislation, the Business Activity Tax Simplification Act, or BATSA, would require a business to have some type of physical presence in a given state, excluding a de minimis 
presence of fewer than 14 days during a taxable year before a state would be permitted to impose a tax on the business. We believe this is a reasonable and bright line standard that businesses could use to plan for their tax responsibilities so that they are not hit unexpectedly with large tax liabilities from states in which they have no physical presence. BATSA would end the confusion that exists as a result of contradictory state court decisions and the refusal of the Supreme Court to decide the issue. It would apply to business activity taxes, including income and franchise taxes, but it, would apply, but it would not apply to transaction taxes, such as sales tax. We believe it is fair for a state to tax in-state businesses as though that they regularly conduct business there, but we believe it is grossly unfair for any state to reach out and assert that simply passing through the state or selling a few products in the state allows a tax-based total countrywide income. A business should only pay income and similar taxes where it is physically present and therefore receives the benefits and protections of the State Government. There is no reason to delay any longer, members of this subcommittee. The time, to, the time is right to end unfair business taxation and to make it clear that State taxation of out-of-State entities can only be done within certain well-defined limits. And American businesses are not acting, asking for a handout from the Congress, only a fair and level playing field free from the unexpected tax surprises that I have described to you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Ducharme. Our next witness is Captain Steve Engelman, President of Herman Sand and Gravel in Herman, Missouri, Missouri or Missouri? Depends on where you're from. <laughs> okay. Steve completed his river pilot training at the River School in Memphis, Tennessee in 2002 and has been employed at Herman Sand and Gravel since 2000. He began managing the plant in 2005. In 2010, he became president of the company that employs 10 people. Herman Sand offers a wide variety of services to his clients, including the sale of sand and gravel, commercial towing services on the Missouri River from St. Louis to Sioux City, Iowa, transportation of construction equipment, tugboat service, and commercial dock repair assistance. Thank you for being with us today, Captain Engelman. Good morning, Chairman, uh, members of the committee. I want to thank you for the invitation to come. My name is uh, Steve Engelman. I am here representing the marine industry as president of Herman Sand and Gravel Incorporated, located in Herman, Missouri, about an hour and a half west of St. Louis. We are a, a small family business that operates on the Missouri River. Uh, it was founded in 1978. It is owned by my mother, Melba, my brother, Tim, and myself. We operate two sand and gravel plants, one in Herman, Missouri, and the other in Jefferson City, Missouri. And we employ 10. We have recently grown our business by leasing a tow line vessel, which employs seven at any time it's operating. We pay above average wages, although the local economy has stretched our budget. We continue to offer 100 percent of employer paid health and care coverage. While other businesses in the area have closed, we continue to research new ways to retain and maintain security for our business and our employees. Today I have been asked to speak about the impediments of regulation on small business in the maritime industry. I can assure you that these regulations and federal policies have constricted my business and, if left unchecked, will be the ultimate demise of my business and others that work on the Missouri River. Let me begin by communicating which government agencies uh, regulate our business. These agencies include the United States Coast Guard, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the United States Department of Labor, Mine Safety and Health Administration, the Department of Transportation, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Department of Natural Resources. I have been trying to get dredging permits renewed since uh, I came to work for the company in 2000. We have spent $185,000. $952 in the last five years for an environmental impact statement and litigation pending to restore our permits to their original tonnage. There have been numerous meetings, trips, seminars, conferences I have attended so I can press the issue. The condition that hurts us the most is a 300,000 ton per five mile limit which was imposed on us last year. We are permitted to dredge 120,000 tons at that spot of our permit and uh, once we compete with other companies in that area that have much larger permits, uh, we, we have to go 
farther up the river, about seven miles, and our equipment is not, our dredging equipment is not big enough, so then we're just out the tonnage. MSHAW uh, is an inspection agency that will come and inspect our uh, equipment. They will fine us for anything that's wrong. They don't before we give them a chance to fix anything. Uh, we certainly are for safety. I believe that uh, you should be fined if you're negligent, if you don't fix your equipment, but if you fix it, you should not be fined. After uh, dredging permits were limited in 2008, we started looking for other work that would create uh, new jobs for our employees. And we had a mine that was close to our facility that was looking for barge transportation, and we was able to ship 22,000 tons of commercial freight out of our sand dock in 2009, and this year we're going to be estimating that we ship 60,000 tons. The Coast Guard is making vessels go through inspections on a regular basis. I agree that it's uh, the need for a safe vessel, but it's, they seem to have lost their desire to mark the channel with navigational aids. The Coast Guard can shut my vessel down, but it seems to be okay if we don't have a proper channel or a properly marked channel. I th believe that it should be a joint effort to ensure that businesses like ours continue to succeed while understanding the need for regulations. And I feel like we should have the opportunity to audit the Coast Guard and the Corps just like they audit us. And we could work together to grow the betterment of the river maritime industry. The rivers, and particularly the Missouri River, could give great relief to the highways of Missouri and beyond. The Missouri River is a world highway and allows our small company to compete on a global market. There are numerous benefits to a successful barge traffic. You've got 64 semi-loads on just one barge. There is a lot of freight on the Missouri River and willing and hungry terminals that want to ship the product. The obstacle standing between small business and successful revenue is the government. One thing that's most important to us is something that you can help with uh, at Congress, you must pass a budget. Operating without a budget does, uh, it, it can't, it gives, uh, the, the government agency can't provide, they can't provide any assistance to the public if they don't know how much money they will be allotted. Our goal is to move enough river commerce to be a fully funded river on the Missouri River, which is a billion ton miles. All the while that I'm supposed to be running a business, piloting a boat, and managing uh, and maintaining my fleet, I spend hours a day trying to work with the same governing agencies that seem to put me out of business. I'm not expecting handouts. I'm not looking for a grant. I want the gov government to provide me the service and stick with the plan that our forefathers laid out ahead of us. We are proud Americans with a strong German heritage in Herman, Missouri, and we are determined that we want to leave this business to our children, just as our father did for us. We want to provide a safe, secure, and honest living for our employees. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Engelman. Our final witness is Dr. Yusuf Rashid Somalia, professor and director of the Fisheries Economics Research Unit at the University of British Columbia's Fisheries Center. He specializes in bioeconomics, marine ecosystem valuation, and the analysis of global issues such as fisheries subsidies, illegal reported and unregulated fishing, and the economics of high and deep seas fisheries. Dr. Somalia has experience working in fisheries and natural resource projects in Norway, Canada, and the North Atlantic region, Namibia, and the Southern African region. Ghana and West African region, and Hong Kong and the South China Sea. You got a lot of frequent flyer miles. Thank you for your participation in this hearing, Dr. Somalia. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman West and uh, <clears throat> Tipman and all of you. I'm really grateful for having the opportunity to share some of our research results with you. Uh, the first point I want to make is uh, uh, I, I'm not you know, my research area does not cover the specific status and legislative proposals being discussed here at this hearing. But my hope is that our research, our global research, our broad-based economic research may enrich the hearing, even though I'm not into the specifics of the, of the hearing. 
Uh, essentially, what we do we at my center and my group in particular, because we are the economists there, we try to study the ocean fisheries and, and try to, to inform and provide research to society in order to find ways that we can maintain the flows of benefits from our oceans through time for the current generation of people, uh, businesses like you, and the future. So we look at marine recreational activities, and in there we are looking at recreational fishing, whale watching, marine mammal watching, uh, diving and kayaking, and all sorts of things that take place on the ocean. And our research shows that this is a huge source of economic uh, uh, values and benefits to the U.S. and to countries around the world. Uh, for example, we estimate that about over one million people get their incomes and jobs from from marine related activities and the u s is a big uh, provides a big chunk of this about fifty billion dollars are made out of uh, recreational marine marine recreational activities and what is even more interesting about one twenty million people around the world go to the ocean for fun. This is where the jobs come from and where the profits and the and the dollars come from. So this is a very important source, and the way we manage them and, 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 and ensure that they keep going is, is very important. Now, I've told you how important this is economically, but we all agree, I think, here that the, 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 the source of this economic well-being is actually the ecosystem. We need to maintain the ecosystem, make it healthy, because upon that comes all these benefits. So that is fundamental. Uh, <coughs> So, if you go to the economic theory of common property, I mean, if you want to keep a healthy ecosystem, which is a common pool, then you, unfortunately, you will have to have some regulation, and I think you agree to that. The key thing is to see how to do this in such a way that it does not stop small businesses from surviving, and that is crucial. But regulation we need because of the common property nature. And I draw from, uh, from Adam Smith, one of my, my main economic heroes, and I think for many here, the invisible man uh, economist who is the most famous one, I think. He says that the nature, nature and the resources they contain belongs to every generation. And the current generation has no right to, to blind it up for future generations. He said this in 1766 in a lecture in, in the UK. Uh, I wasn't there, but it looked like so I was there at the time. So we need to manage these resources for all generations. And this is Adam Smith himself talking. And that means that some regulation is needed some management. We need to bring all the activities into a management system that will ensure that we keep drawing the benefits through time. Now, in terms of conclusion, I think, as I've said again and again, our, our research and those of colleagues around the world show that marine recreational activities support billions of dollars of businesses and that these businesses have impacts on the ecosystem, and that is the other part of the equation. You know, the more we go there, you have 120 million going there, there's going to be impacts, and therefore we need to find a way to manage that if we want these benefits to continue coming through. And from economic theory, as I said, deregulating completely, I mean, deregulating common pool resources can be risky because of the, the general push to, if there's money to be made, we will all want to make it, so we need to have some ways to regulate that so that we can continue to get the benefits. Uh, finally, it is important to not forget the fact that a healthy environment is the basis of any economy, no matter how sophisticated the economy is. I made this point at the recent Rio, Rio summit. There was a big dialogue there, and I was one of the panelists. Uh, economists, we, we realize that an economy is based on taking resources from nature. Uh, we take the fish, we take the oil, the gas from the oceans and so on, and we do all our economic activities. And what do we do at the end of it? We pump out, we pump out the things we don't like, right? The pollutants, the pollution into the ocean. So it's important to recognize that you need nature. And anything we can do to maintain our ecosystems is really uh, important and good for the jobs and the money and the fun we drive from, from nature. And I just wanted to make this uh, declared to the, to, the, to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. And uh, we can start with my colleague, Mr. Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, 
Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you for your leadership uh, on this issue. I know it's something that's incredibly passionate for you and uh, obviously listening uh, important for our country as well. I come from uh, the high water country of, uh, of the entire nation in Colorado, so our nation, uh, oceans are a little limited up there. But uh, this is something that we obviously all have, uh, I believe, truly in common in terms of uh, regulations that we are feeling as businesses. And uh, Dr. Small, uh, I agree with you and I think everybody on the panel would as well. No one is calling for absolute deregulation. Uh, it's just common sense regulations uh, that we would like to be able to see because uh, we are part of the ecosystem as well and need to be able to survive. Uh, and as we see overreaches from government that uh, are hampering our ability to be able to dredge a river and to be able to keep those people employed, to being able to sell boats in Michigan when you're coming out of Florida, uh, to being able to keep those recreational uh, fleets moving out as well. Uh, I've often found that uh, people get a real appreciation actually for the environment when they're exposed to it and uh, a real appreciation for what is out there. So I do appreciate all of our panel here uh, for being here as well today. And I have a couple of questions here. Um, Ms. Herbert, uh, when you were talking about uh, pretty big industry, $8.9 billion, if I wrote that down correctly, 107,000 jobs, 95 percent of your businesses are small businesses, uh, people that are trying to be able to provide for their families and actually to, to be able to contribute back uh, into those communities as well. Uh, you would mentioned that uh, there is language to be able to con restore congressional intent from 2009. Has it been your experience um, over the course of your participation in this industry that you see a regulatory body uh, that at times runs off on its own track and exceeds uh, congressional intent or completely distorts congressional intent? I, I would have to say I can only really answer on this issue. And um, <clears throat> I think the difference between, you know, the marine industry, a lot of people think of it as a, as a hobby, and it is something that people enjoy. But the fact that we are an industry, um, in this case, Congress spent a lot of time, the part that is really frustrating. I actually have a letter here that I am going to hold up, and it is from August 4, 2004, thanking me for testifying on this issue by Congressman at the time, Vice Chairman, Subcommittee of Workforce Protections, Judy Biggert. That is eight years almost to the day. We vetted this. There was research that was done, um, and yes, for this regulatory agency to supersede the intent, this was bipartisan. This was numerous um, administrations and so on and so forth. I don't think it was done wantfully. I honestly think sometimes there is just a misunderstanding of the industry. We are not here advocating on behalf of yacht owners. We are here advocating on behalf of those 107,000 jobs and families. Um, that, that buy property and have their kids in school and that are Americans. So I think it is more of a misunderstanding versus anything wantful. I am just kind of curious. Uh, there are some of us who believe that uh, before a lot of these regulations go final, it might be a good idea for the regulatory body so that we don't have these type of misunderstandings or misinterpretations uh, go on to be able to bring those regs back for review to the authoritative committee. Would, would that be a sensible approach in your mind? Absolutely, because we would like the opportunity to simply say, and, and I think what happened, the intent was not to cause more of a problem. I think there was just a, a misunderstanding of what the impact would be and the significance of what that impact was. And therefore, if we had had an opportunity to really talk about, here's this definition, here's why that won't work. And the other part I want to make very clear is, it's not only just about the recreational industry and small businesses having a problem. It's also the insurance industry. The insurance industry needed, needs a bright line to be able to go, you're under Longshore or you're not. And remember, you don't get any exclusions from the Longshore unless you have state compensation. Every worker must be covered. So the insurance industry is even more confused. And honestly, what's happened is we are much worse because the insurance industry is saying there's no bright line. We don't really know what this definition means. So pretty much everybody in the repair industry, all of your work is now considered commercial under this definition. And I really don't believe that that would have been the case had we had the opportunity to review it. I think there would have been um, that discovery. Right. And you brought up the American Recovery and Reinvestment mm -hmm. Act uh, and had impacted your businesses. 
Um, was that a success, failure, and, and as it affected your businesses? Well, I, I will say this. Um, I am not happy with a lot that is in there, but uh, section 800, uh, page 862, where there was the amendment for the Longshore, that absolutely affected my business. I will tell you, I was able to um, hire three additional people hmm. after that went through. Just to give you an understanding of what this Longshore means, and I am not sure, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but um, the recreational marine industry makes the difference between, let's say, you have got Longshore and you have got State Comp. Okay? The difference is when it comes into total disability and you have death benefits and lifetime. And you know what? That is something that is absolutely deserving for those people that are working in those hazardous environments. The recreational industry makes up 0.001 percent of 0.001 percent of total disability workers' comp claims, meaning 99.99 percent of the time. It has nothing to do with our industry. Therefore, when you compare apples to apples, state comp is adequate with Longshore. However, when you are talking about money, the money to that, it takes my workers' comp and multiplies it three times. So now I am up to upwards of $0.50, cents, $50 per every $100 of payroll going to workers' comp. I can't have labor rates that are competitive. In South Florida, they are going to go to the Bahamas. In and, and Pacific Northwest, they are going to go to Canada. Um, in the Pacific Southwest, they are going to go to Mexico. These boats are mobile and they have choices. So for, for us, um, that was extremely significant because it was immediately jobs stayed here. Boatyards saved hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it is the boatyards that enable workers like myself to come in, plumbers, electricians, builders. So honestly, the ARRA saved our industry with that. Um, we were able to be in a position that we could hold tight when, when our economy was really not going to go well. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Ducharme, I am a small business guy, too. And uh, one of the frustrations I think that uh, many of us have is we continue to see moving goalposts, uh, not only in terms of the regulatory process that Ms. Herbert was just talking about, uh, but also in regards to the tax code. Uh, can you maybe speak to the importance of being able to have some real certainty uh, in terms of uh, what we need to have in terms of tax code and regulation in this Absolutely. country? Absolutely. The, uh, <clears throat> the issue that, uh, that arises is, is uh, twofold, in, in the first one being not the most significant, but is, is uh, significant in the sense that from a competitive standpoint, if the tax regs are not consistently applied, and applied to everyone in the industry that you are in, then the price point that you are uh, charging for your bo boat would be need to be higher to offset that those uh, tax liabilities, or and and ultimately you won't be competitive in your in your industry. So having a clear understanding uh, across the entire breadth of your competitors allows you to compete on a level playing field. So some real uh, common sense and some real certainty. You could save a lot of money probably in terms of attorney fees that you have mentioned, $100,000 I think is what I wrote down. That is, uh, yes, the case and, uh, that we are You probably would have invested that in your business, helped Absolutely. keep people employed, uh, expanded your business and tried to be able to grow it. Uh, and the and the government's policies are inhibiting that uh, development of capital to be directed in those directions. Well, the state's actions by aggressively pursuing those out-of-state corporations and us needing the federal government to keep that flow of interstate commerce going without the impediments of states saying we're looking for revenue. Out-of-state corporations seem to be the easiest to uh, uh, get that uh, revenue from. So let's go after them, because they know at the end of the day the, the cost to actually uh, argue and go to court and, and fight for what is, appears to be obvious um, is very expensive. Right. Appreciate that. Uh, Captain, I wanted to be able to ask, and I, I apologize, I'm going over time, Mr. Chairman, here a little bit. But Continue on. Um, with the dredging permits, how long has it taken you to be able to get these permits renewed? We, we've been on an extension since 2000. Since 2000. We're in 2012? Right. 12 years. 
to be able to do that. Uh, sometimes they'll give you a six-month extension. Sometimes it's a year. Does that create some uncertainty for you? Yeah. Why would I invest in my business? You don't know when you're, if you're permit, if you're going to be dredging next year. You know, you got the, the sales are always there and the sand's always there. You know, but if you don't, if you can't get a permit to operate, then why invest? Great. I speak. I think that speaks to a very important point that uh, we've tried to address through this committee, committee, and through a variety of committees in terms of the regulatory uncertainty that we're seeing and uh, the inability, uh, apparently, of this government. Uh, to be able to give some certainty to people in the private sector when it gets down to some of the permitting. It is an unending process that we are dealing with, it seems like, that is truly hurting our ability to be able to create jobs. And I wanted to go a little bit to uh, your point in regards to MSHA as well uh, and the thoughts that uh, they come in the door and it seems to be a fine and punish mentality as opposed to improve and correct. Is that right. a fair I, assessment? Right. Yeah, it's, it's a Whenever they come, they find anything they find wrong with the fine, depending on how severe the fine or how dangerous the situation is that they may have found, and then it's it's a, an allotted fine, you know, based on your employees, based on how many times you've been fined for that same thing before. Uh, you know, it's it's a, quite an equation to come with with your fine amount. Um, we 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 try to do the best that we can, you know, uh, to prevent them, obviously, uh, because we want to have a safe work environment for our employees. But uh, we would f fix anything that they found wrong, and most everything that they do find wrong after the fine, we have it fixed before they leave. The inspector leaves, or a minimum of 24 hours uh, of having. By the time they come back to close out our our inspection, so it's a, a, f a fine doesn't, f you know, it's just a, an extra expense that you have to put in your budget every year. It doesn't make a, our company any safer to me. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, believe it or not, we have that in a lot of businesses. I've dealt with OSHA as well with the same principle yeah. of uh, wanting to be able to come in and find and punish. Um, uh, I guess I'd like to almost close, and uh, if you'd, you'd speak to this, Captain, uh, you did made it that uh, you, know, you are held to a high standard. You have no problem with that. You want to make sure that you are doing it safely, doing it properly. Uh, but government is not holding itself to that same high standard. Uh, if they don't mark the channels correctly, uh, you can actually have a problem with being able to safely operate your business because government has failed to do the job that they are charged with doing. How many fines has government paid? I don't know. My tugboat has been stuck for two days in a spot that we can't get through. How much is that costing you? It's probably $4,500 a day. And We've got a crew of seven. We're pushing fertilizer to Nebraska City. And whose responsibility, just to be clear, was it to be able to mark that channel? Was it yours? No. Whose? Coast Guard and the Coast Corps, Guard? Corps of Engineers. Okay, and the Corps of Engineers. Well, the Corps of Engineers would make the channel navigable, but it's, uh, we're, we're having uh, issues on the Missouri River with the Endangered Species Act where they uh, make habitat, and we have more water going through the habitat channels than we have in the river, navigable river. There's a 40-foot deep channel where the palace surgeons are supposed to be swimming, and I got seven feet where my barge is supposed to be. Well, I appreciate that, and I, I, again, I appreciate our panel uh, taking the time to be able to be here. I know it's an expense, and uh, when you could actually be out doing your job uh, as opposed to sitting in Washington, but I think this is important uh, just to be able to shine the light of day that uh, government can have some real impact. Sometimes uh, there, there are a few positives that are out there, but we've got to be able to bring some common sense to this regulatory policy, to the taxation policy, and to be able to make sure uh, that we have that common sense balance uh, to be able to meet uh, the needs not only of our environment, but uh, that other portion of the environment, uh, the American people as well. So thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tipton. Uh, my first question overall to the panel, uh, do you think that there is a negative stigma that is associated with the marine industry here in the United States of America? Yes. Can you elaborate? or? Absolutely. I, I again think it is a misunderstanding that this is all about um, gluttonous, just having fun, that um, um, rich yacht owners are, um, you know, 
taking advantage of the government and you don't want to be regulated and there's nothing that could be further from the truth. In fact, I think that the government should mandate that anybody that makes over a certain amount of money be forced to buy a boat of certain size because <laughs> the quickest way to put money into the economy is buy a boat. You're either going to constantly be fueling, provisionally, repairing, all of those things and all of those things each and every step of the way create jobs and money. So there's a huge misunderstanding. Anyone else? On average, what what you know per year uh, with with one, you know, give give us an example. What's the provisioning for you know one boat or one yacht or, or, or recreational vessel that you see? Well, I can give you one example of a, a boat that's a 150 foot boat, um, U.S. built. Their annual budget is 4.5 million dollars, and that is that is just maintenance. That is, um, I'm going to get some repair. I'm going to provision. That does not include fuel which me, every state or anywhere they go to get fuel, those taxes go, and especially in the state of Florida, they go to the general revenue. Um, but that is basically you have crew to maintain it. You are going to Whole Foods or Publix or your Stop and Shop or your Kroger's or whatever your grocery store is. Um, that's a general maintenance, $4.5 million. Dr. Somalia, um, you talked about balancing ecosystems, and I, I thoroughly agree with you. Um, I'm a master scuba diver myself, and of course you can't get out to dive unless you have a boat. Uh, one of the things that we have down in South Florida we're finding is that an invasionary species was introduced there. The lionfish has no natural predators. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's promoted locally are lionfish rodeos where you get, you know, dive boats to go out and, uh, you know, whack these little rascals, and they're good eating uh, as well. So I think that we do have those systems in place. It doesn't always have to be, you know, by the government coming down with regulation. But you have people that understand that the ecosystem is necessary for them to be able to go out and enjoy, uh, you know, the boating. So I think that you have a system of policing oneself. My question to you is that when you sit and look at the recreational uh, industry, boating industry here in the United States of America, as far as you know, them taking care of their ecosystem. How does that, you know, compare to some of the other places that you've been in in, in your travels? Yeah, you, you are right, Congressman, about that regulation is not just about the government. It's, it's about the people themselves, and it goes all through the system. We talk about co-management a lot in, in places where you have uh, business people meeting with government officials to find a way to do it in a co-management sense. And you also have situations where the businesses and the communities take care of their things. So, so there's a wide range of uh, making sure that we make and keep the ecosystem healthy. But, but when, you, when you do a comparative analysis between mm. what you see here in America, as, as you say, you've done studies here and research mm. with other countries where you travel, you know, how does the United States of America rate as far as our recreational mm. uh, marine industry and how we are caring for our ecosystem? Yeah, this is a question I, I haven't specifically looked at, so, so I wouldn't be able to give you the scientific kind of answer where you can. But if you go to South Africa and Namibia, they do have recreational fisheries. And uh, when I compare them and the U.S., it's reasonably similar, actually, because they do a good job, too, relatively to, to the U.S. So, yeah, South Africa and Namibia are almost on par with the U.S. in terms of managing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hebert, you know, one of the things that uh, you talked about how uh, this statute, this amendment was part of the American uh, Reinvestment Recovery Act, mm -hmm. that's law. Mm -hmm. And so how do you think it's possible that a government agency can come back and all of a sudden supersede something that was law? I'm not sure. I think um, that as Congressman Tipton suggested, I don't know that that was their intention. I think that um, there was a statute with a definition, and they thought, well, let's make the definition better to understand that intent. Um, had they sat down with the repair segment of the industry and had that conversation and gone through the review and, and done the legislative review of that, they would have seen that that wasn't accurate. I think it's communication. Mm -hmm. I don't know why um, that was the case. And so they did not do any type of checking with the industry whatsoever? Uh, there was a comment period put out. We did provide comments. I know that there was some discussion with the manufacturing portion of the industry, and there was that was a very positive um, relationship. I just think on the repair side, 
Um, it was deemed insignificant. It um, was never reviewed by uh, Office of uh, Budget Management because, again, it was deemed insignificant. And but there, is it insignificant to you? Absolutely not. Okay. So, again, we have an instance where regulatory fiat trumped the legislative process in your estimation. And, and a long term, and I, and, and I do want, want to say that this was a long, many um, Congress's different um, you know, presidents, whether it was Republican or Democrat administration, this, this spanned over four Congresses. The work was done. Mr. Ducharme, a uh, question. You, you ship your boats worldwide. Can you give us a comparison between the problems that you have that you brought up with Michigan and New Jersey or some others as opposed to uh, when you're shipping your, your product worldwide? I mean, are you, do you find yourself being at a, a greater disadvantage, you know, doing operations right here within the United States of America than doing it globally? Well, it's uh, the most difficult to understand and most cumbersome, absolutely. But uh, from an international standpoint, we ship to uh, 20 different countries around the world. And uh, our responsibility stops once we deliver our product to the boat. So my understanding and, and uh, information that I have about the European Union or Russia or China is pretty limited. Mm -hmm. But domestically, um, it's, it's cumbersome. It's um, impossible to capture and understand how, what state or what municipality may be going after our industry and what tactics they may use to determine if they are going to um, send you a questionnaire, call you on the phone, tell you that they have your boats, you got to pay some money in order to get them. So it is um, it, not easy to plan for. Mm -hmm. With the growth and the, the, the advent of the Internet, do you think that that would provide you the right type of presence in other states? Do you think that that would meet that, uh, that qualification? Um, as far as the Internet, as it, and selling our product? Well, being able to have a presence in some of these other states, so because uh, that is what you were talking about, this ability to say that you have a presence so that you don't receive this type of taxation. A physical presence, correct. Yes. Yes. So if there is a bright line standard that says if you have these particular employees, uh, property, payroll, and you have contact with our state that exceed a certain number of times per year because you are aggressively soliciting sales in our state, then you are going to be fall under our tax, taxing jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, we are not trying to avoid tax, but you need to, uh, you know, you will still pay tax within the uh, uh, state that you are domiciled. Mm -hmm. what is, uh, do you have any other state taxes that you get hit on? Um, yes, we pay in uh, the state of Washington, uh, Michigan, I mentioned, New Jersey, and Louisiana, and Texas, and uh, New Hampshire. Captain Mingaman, uh, you bring up a, a great point that affects, I think, this industry as a whole with our inland waterways, our ports, and what have you. Um, why do you think it is taking so long for the Corps of Engineers to get through dredging permits? There is a, a, a vast region that we are permitted. We are all permitted together on the Missouri River as one permit. We have individual pits, permits to our company, but we have uh, Kansas City to the mouth at St. Louis, and there is a wide range of problems that the local areas may or may not have. You know, like in Kansas City, they have a bed degradation issue that is not uh, the same where I operate in Herman, Missouri. We don't have that issue, but I'm still delayed with my permits. Do you, um, you mentioned earlier in your testimony all the different agencies that you have to go through, all the wickets you have to do. Do they ever have monthly or quarterly coordination meetings where you can sit down and do the one-stop shopping uh, <laughs> instead of having to stovepipe with each one of these agencies? And do you find that there, there is no crosstalk and coordination between these agencies that you have to contend with? Yeah, there is no crosstalk. Cross talk, excuse me. Um, a, a similar issue with, uh, like to say, my dredge operator got an injury uh, a few weeks ago. I reported an accident report to Emshaw and the Coast Guard, you know, because he's a Marine employee. But 
uh, beans were regulated by MSHA, we have to report it as a mine incident as well. So just, just one example of the, it's, it's, we're crossing all the time. You talked about the, uh, the navigation devices. Uh, how often have you told the Coast Guard about your, this issue with the navigation devices and what type of response have you gotten back? Uh, they, uh, you know, whenever, after a few months go by of negligence, then, you know, you'll get some response and then they'll come out and try to do better. Uh, you know, there's, there's big opportunities on the Missouri River to be successful if we can, if we can get the Coast Guard and the Corps of Engineers to work with us. Um, we, we've increased our business tremendously this year. It's got a lot of potential. When you talk about the, uh, the penalties and fines that you get, uh, you know, are you aware of these checklists that they have? Do th are these uh, spot inspections? Are they schedule inspections? And you know, if you are, as you said, able to uh, rectify the situation on the spot while the inspector is there, do you still find yourself getting penalized and fined? Still get fined, yes, sir. Even but if you correct it right there on the spot? Even if you correct it right there. Annually, Last year, you know, how how much of an economic impact did that have on you? Oh, I'd say four or five thousand, probably. Well, I mean, we 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 try to do our best, you know. Like I say, um, and uh, we appeal something if it's a large fee or something, but it's. But even in appealing, does that cost you money in the appealing process? Takes my time or, or, personally. You know, it's it, you got to book uh, regulations, you know, from every agency that you try to follow. And unless you have, uh, in a large company, they probably could have a full-time person be a safety and compliance like, person. Right. But small business, you can't, if you can't afford it. Because you only have 10 employees. I only have 10 employees. Most of them are out there on the river. R exactly. To include yourself. Including myself. Do you sometimes feel that these folks are coming down and they're working, you know, counter to you? Yes, sir. I'd, uh will hire a consultant sometimes, like a safety consultant, if I feel like we're not keeping up as good as we should, or a, a new regulation that I don't understand, uh, then I hire a professional consultant. But then once in. again, that cuts into your profit margin. Minimum of $1,500 for basically a day or two. They'll come out and might do a safety audit on your company or check for noise or dust or something, you know, that something that we've... Uh, there's no, there's no way we could ever be out of those limits. It's not possible. We're, we're, just for an example of dust, we have to check that annually. The Emshaw checks it annually. We're dredging sand that's wet. I mean, it's, it's never going to have dust, you know. But <laughs> we still have to check it. Excuse me for laughing. And it's, 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 it gets to be very frustrating. You know, we. We intend to be there a long time, and, and we've, we've got long-term employees. I've been here 20 years and growing, and, you know, everything we invest in our community, in our business, and it's very frustrating. You know, you and uh, Ms. Hebert are generational businesses. How do you look at the death tax and how that's going to affect you? If we're talking about taking this from 35 percent bracket to 55 percent bracket, dropping the minimum exemption level from five million down to one million, I mean, are we going to be able to continue to pass on to subsequent generations uh, the businesses that you know your fathers and forefathers created for you? In my opinion, no. Um, I think it's going to create <clears throat> such a disincentive or hurdles that instead of being focused on investing in our businesses and figuring out how, I mean, I, I plan on being there for our 100th anniversary, um, and I want to make sure that that happens, but when you have these, these, these hurdles such as this, I mean, how do you overcome that? And I think what's going to ha happen is there, there will be a way, and eventually it will right itself. But how many travesties and how many businesses are not going to be there or that are not going to make it through? And at the same time, while our government, you know, as, as Captain Engman said, we aren't looking for subsidies. We're not looking for any support. The where, Congressman, where is the world's largest boat show? Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. The city, the, the state, and the county have contributed in the 53 years of this show zero dollars. And that's okay because it's still the world's largest boat show. But when you have governments, I just came back from Taiwan last week. In Taiwan, 
The United States is between number two and number five on the global order book. Taiwan is number seven. This government, in addition to creating a reg regulatory environment that doesn't have hurdles for generations, which, by the way, that is a very generational, um, they are touting themselves, marching towards status as the world's luxury yacht manufacturing capital of the world. And with incentives and, and regulations that are for, I mean, they are building an entire waterfront. And you talk about Army Corps of Engineers, I saw a boatyard change its facilities in one year, and they now are able to put their boats in the water. Dredging was done in six months. There wasn't an Army Corps. Now, is that going to happen overnight? But when these countries figure it out that we are going to overregulate ourselves, the business will go elsewhere, just like other industries it has. And I think that um, the death tax is very symbolic of that. Um, again, I don't think it will be forever gone, but there will be many businesses. It will recreate our industry. We won't have the heritage. But as a small family business, we take pride, and our goal is we, we raise our kids in the family business. They are part of our everyday life. And if you have to pay 50 percent tax for the next generation just to get it, that's not going to happen. You know, you would end up selling the business. Would you say that our marine industry is a generational industry? Yes, sir. We're th going to be, uh, uh, we're second generation, going to be going on third, hopefully. Anything else, Mr. Tipton? I just had uh, maybe one more, Mr. Chairman. So, yeah, showing the picture of the yacht, I have, have a friend, and he said the only thing better than owning your own boat is having a friend who owns a boat. Uh, so, <laughs> when you were talking about the ongoing expenses, but uh, it obviously does create employment. Uh, you know, I do serve on the um, uh, small business subcommittee and chair of that, overseeing energy, ag, and trade. And um, one thing that uh, we're always looking for are ways to be able to help American businesses really to be able to export. Uh, you're talking about the Taiwanese uh, wanting to become the world's largest yacht builders uh, to be able to export those uh, boats over here. Uh, but I am a little surprised uh, because I think it's positive and, and we'd like to be able to see that grow of U.S. exports uh, being about 21 per we export about 21 percent of the power boats manufactured here. Uh, given that many of you are involved in to some degree exporting or facilitating some of the exporting that is going on. Uh, are there any additional set, steps that you see that Congress should be considering and should be undertaking uh, to streamline or improve that pro part of the process? I will answer quickly on that. I, I, because I am not in the manufacturing and as far as the export, what I, what I would say is remember that these are boats and they can come back, that if we export them, they don't have to go away mm -hmm. because they can come right back. And let's make it easy for them to come back as foreign goods, and let's make sure that we still give them every incentive to come back, spend money in our U.S. waters. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My final question comes back to the first question. We talked about the negative stigma on the marine industry. Uh, I would like, like to ask each and every one of you, what do you think that we can do to put a a true American face on this industry to make sure that we do not have regulatory agencies that are coming up with their own little rules and changing rules that go against law, that we can make sure that agencies are out there supporting our business growth and ensure that we can have production manufacturing and also the transfer of goods along our, uh, our inland waterways. So what would be your suggestions to help us to ensure that we keep the marine industry vibrant and safe to go on for future generations? Uh, well, I think the, um, the point that you make that putting a human face on the industry is, is the most critical. You know, we, we work with and are a member of the National Marine Manufacturers Association, and, and each one of the manufacturers that are a member of the group uh, contribute based on the number of engines that they buy from the likes of Mercury and or Volvo. And advertising and putting the human face on the family aspect and the jobs that all manufacturers create within the United States. It is a, it is a luxury good, but it is for enjoyment. And responsible boaters are passionate boaters. And 
they take care of waterways and they take responsibility for the environmental impact. And you find now that, as Ms. Hebert mentioned, it is an expensive hobby. And you don't go into it unless you have a lot of passion for boating. And that is the face and the uh, relationship that we have to make with manufacturing and pleasure boating within the U.S. The uh, one thing that the agencies that regulate us need to have personal interaction with our companies, the, whether it be the Corps, or Coast Guard, or uh, MSHA, uh, the, especially the, the people that make the rules. They need, I want them to come talk to me. I want them to get on my equipment. I want them to get in my mind and uh, see how we work, see how their rules are going to affect us. And the, the, there's got to be some common sense approach. The, you look at what, how this company exports goods for basically money. I mean, we've got a terrific debt. And the goods that we're shipping on the Missouri River is, is cash. You know, we're we taking soybeans out of the Midwest that are very valuable globally. And that's, that's got to be very important to hold that transportation asset open so we can safely transit. You know, the more goods we get down that river, the more cash comes in. You know, it's, to me, it's very simple. It's like the, I consider the Missouri River to be like the eighth wonder of the world. I mean, it's the, it was a feat. Whenever they did built and designed this thing for two or 2,500 miles, between the dams and the, the property that was created to grow crops, and then they had the most efficient transportation mode highway built all in the same, to try to get, I don't know how many states it is, all thinking the same, and that's a feat. And now we're blowing holes in it. You know, it's, they, lost, they lost the common sense approach to keeping our marine system active, viable, and efficient. Thank you. Yes, uh, <laughs> so the first point is uh, for the U.S. to do all the country can do to maintain a healthy ecosystem. Taiwan, Thailand, what if they keep doing, allowing things to be taken down and the U.S. maintains its own, the businesses will come back here. So that is crucial. And how to do that is the common sense regulation, and you have to think of the businesses, make sure we are not putting too much burden on, on them whilst we do all we can to maintain the ecosystem. And another thing that maybe U.S. can do, because U.S. is an influential, powerful nation, is actually looking at these other countries and using whatever instruments and mechanisms to make sure that they don't disadvantage U.S. companies. I think there are ways you could do that. So Taiwan, if you want to do business with the U.S., there are certain things you've got to do or we don't do business with you. Because that will help us avoid getting into what economies say, term raising to the bottom. Because if we all just keep saying, okay, if, if you regulate us and they don't, with a disadvantage, which is true, you are going to keep going down and we lose ecosystems that we all need and depend on for these businesses to go on. So maybe that could be another channel to use. Hmm. Well, I think um, I'm probably going to reiterate what all of my colleagues have said, is that um, a lot of it is communication. Hmm. I have to say, in fairness, I've never um, sat down with a legislator, regardless where they are from, and by the end of the conversation not have them understand that the marine industry, many times there is an aha mm. moment, depending on um, where they are from. Not, uh, not everybody is blessed to be South Florida representative. But um, there is always an understanding once it is explained. So some of that, that onus is on our um, behalf, and I think it is all working together. Um, I think having a level playing field with trade agreements, mm -hmm. being able to do some things back and forth so there isn't that incentive one way or the other that is mm -hmm. heavy. Um, and just really getting past the word yacht mm -hmm. um, and, and knowing that that is okay. Big boats are good things and big boats equal big jobs. 
Well, thank you all again for being with us today. And as Chairman Kaufman noted in his opening statement, the coastal and inland water transportation system is often the economic lifeblood of the regions where they are located. Small businesses across the country utilize our ports, our rivers, our lakes for a wide variety of applications for commerce and recreation alike. The maritime industry is a significant contributor to our national economy, and the Federal Government needs to do a better job of balancing priorities so that these waterways are maintained so that they remain valuable resources that they are. I look forward to working with all of you on these issues presented today. And again, I appreciate you being with us today, and thank you for your testimony. I ask for unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. And without objection, so ordered, this hearing is now adjourned.